liberty, let's stand together. Father, we love you and we thank you that you've allowed us to be in this place today to worship you, to lift your name on high. Father, we come to this place, hearts overflowing with gratitude and love, adoration for who you are and what you do in our lives. God, I pray that as we've gathered together, you would unite us as we worship you through song, as we worship you through giving, as we worship you through the hearing and the heeding of your word. God, whatever you choose to do in this place today, we'll give you all the praise, the honor, and glory for you alone are worthy. It's in Jesus' name we pray all these things. All God's people said, amen. Let's sing. I searched the world But it couldn't fill me Man's empty praise And treasures that fade Are never enough That you came along And put me back together is now satisfied and here in your love oh sing together oh there's nothing better than you there's nothing better than you Lord there's nothing no nothing is better than you
give the Lord some praise this morning. I don't know if you know this or not, but the same Jesus that performed miracles in the Scripture is the same Jesus that performs miracles in 2020. Amen? He turns seas into highways, bones into armies. I love that. He turns graves into gardens. The Bible says that we were dead in our trespasses and sins, but yet he quickened us. He made us alive. I'm so thankful that I serve a God that is capable of turning dead men to alive and well. Amen? amen. Are you glad to be in God's house this morning? Say amen. 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 Members, thank you for your faithfulness. If you're visiting with us, we are honored that you chose to worship with us. Whether you're here in person or watching online, thank you for doing so today. The Bible says we're two or more gathered in my name. I am there in the midst of them, and we already feel his presence in this place. Amen. 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 Well, if you really are glad to be in God's house this morning, find someone you hadn't said good morning to. Tell them you're glad to see them in God's house. Yeah.
sits on heaven's mercy seat. Sing, worthy is the Lamb. sing that chorus one time. Jesus, we adore you, we worship you, we praise you, we love you. We recognize with all of creation that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the second person in the Trinity, the one that left heaven to come to this earth, to live a perfect, sinless life, to sacrifice yourself on the cross of Calvary, to shed your blood as a perfect, sinless Lamb of God to forever pay for the sins past, present, and future for the entire world. Because of that, we sing now and we'll sing forever. Worthy is the lamb that was slain. The only one that's worthy. The only one deserving of our praise. The only one deserving of our worship. We feel your presence in this room today. Father, just just as you walked the face of this earth over 2,000 years ago and your apostles, your disciples saw you face to face, God, we see you face to face today. We feel your presence in this room. God, we ask you to do great things here today in this room, those who are watching online. For Liberty Baptist Church, God, we, we pray for blessings. We pray for lives to be changed and all men would be drawn closer to you. And God, as we pray every week, whatever you choose to do in this place, we give you the praise, the honor, and the glory, for you alone deserve it. It's in Jesus' name we pray all these things. Amen. You may be seated. My Savior's love for me. 
Thank you, Brother Hill. Take your Bibles this morning. We're going to be in the Old Testament. Book of Isaiah, chapter 64. Isaiah, chapter 64. It's good to see you this morning. Whether you're here in person, we appreciate our church family and friends, visitors being with us this morning, and also those of you that are listening online, those of you that will be listening at a later date, uh, we appreciate you attending into the worship services Don't just be a bystander, we're all here to worship, amen? That means we're to engage our hearts, our minds, all of, every part of us into what God wants to do this morning. Isaiah chapter 64, let's begin reading in verse number 1 if you would please. Isaiah 64, 1, Oh, that thou wouldest rend the heavens... And that thou wouldest come down, that the mountains might flow down at thy presence. As when the melting fire burneth, the fire causeth the waters to boil, to make thy name known to thine adversaries, that the nations may tremble at thy presence. When thou didst terrible things which we look not for, thou camest down. The mountains flowed down at thy presence. For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard, nor perceived by the ear, neither hath the eye seen, O God, besides thee, what he hath prepared for him that waiteth for him. Thou meetest him that rejoiceth, and worketh righteousness, Those that remember thee in thy ways, behold, thou art wroth. For we have sinned, and those is continuance, and we have, and we shall be saved. But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are as filthy rags. And we all do fade as a leaf. And our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. And there is none that calleth upon thy name, that stirreth up himself to take hold of thee. For thou hast hid thy face from us and hast consumed us because of our iniquities. Father in heaven, Lord, as we come before you again this morning, we're grateful for the time that we can come together. And and God, right at the outset, I admit I need you this morning. I need your Holy Spirit power, your feeling. I need your words to speak through me. God, I need a message from you this morning. And I pray, Father, that you'd meet with Liberty Baptist Church, every single listener, here today and those listening online. And Lord, that you would speak to us through your word and that all the glory would go to you. That souls would be saved and lives would be changed and Christians would find their hearts and their minds rekindled towards the things of God. That they would become passionate again about the things which are eternal. Again, Lord, we ask your power upon this service and your manifested presence in our midst today. And again, we give you all the glory and honor for it all. And all God's people said, Someone has said that of all the great prayers for revival in the Bible, the one that is greatest is found right here in Isaiah chapter 64. When Isaiah considered the goodness of God and he considered all that he had done for God's people, when he considered, in spite of their rebellion, in spite of of all the things that they had done, they had walked away from God so many times. They lived their lives as if they were atheists. They lived their lives as if there was no God. And yet, when they would cry out in prayer for the cleansing of the nation, we see the, the people were saying, where... Where is our God who did the wonders among us? Why is He not working 
on our behalf. I don't know about you, but as I look around our country and our world, sometimes I have to ask that question. And like David, how long, Lord, will the heathen rage? How long will the world go on like this before you step in? I read this week that very soon God's going to have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah if He doesn't destroy America. And you know that, that's, that's a really sad thought, but it's, there's so much truth there. You see what God did to Sodom and Gomorrah and what was going on in that nation, and we see, I believe in my heart and mind, and of course I wasn't there, and I've, I've read the counts, I've read the history, I've read the Scripture, but what I see going on today is much worse in America. The prophet Isaiah looks up and he calls on God. He calls on God to display that power and that presence that they sensed and they experienced in the ancient times. And he asked God to look down and he asked God to come down. Amen. Is that not what we need today, my friends? Just as God came down in fire at Sinai, so let him come down again with awesome revival power for his people today. How he longed, Isaiah, how he longed for God to work the mighty power that he had done in previous years. Folks, this is the heart cry of revival that we see this morning. From the heart of Isaiah, a man that loved God, a, a man that was greatly used of God, we see a great message for you and I this morning, and we see it in verse 1 where he says, Oh, that thou wouldest rend the heavens, and that thou wouldest come down. In other words, would you just rip apart the sky? I long for that day when the Lord Jesus will rip apart the eastern sky and come, and we'll be with him in that time in the second advent. He'll come, and he'll destroy the devil and the antichrist and the false religion of this world. He'll destroy it all with the brightness of his coming. But here we are today, and like Isaiah, we each need a heart cry in our hearts for revival. I went to bed with that thought in my mind. My wife asked me, we were traveling, we traveled about 600 and 700 miles to a funeral. We left, uh, when did we leave? <laughs> we left Friday and uh, we, we got there and stayed the night, uh, uh, grabbed something to eat, visited with Kevin and Kimberly Robertson for just a little bit, uh, then went to bed, got up, went to the funeral and turned right around to come back where we could be with God's people here at Liberty Baptist Church today. It had been easy for us to take off. It had been easy for us just to stay an extra night. And it was a neat little quaint little town. It was very beautiful. And, I mean, they have trees out there in East Texas. We don't have that. That's kind of an amazing thing when you get to actually look what trees look like. But uh, anyway, we, we wanted to be with God's people this morning. We want to be back this morning. And my wife said, are you doing okay? And I, and, and I didn't say anything, but this was just the burning thought in my heart and mind. All that I read, all that I've been seeing, all that I've been examining in our world recently, my thought was, oh, that thou wouldest rend the heavens and come down, oh God. Folks, people need revival today. What's the answer for the crisis in America? What's the answer for the, the, the craziness going on in our world? Revival. Revival. The Bible still says, if my people which are called by my name, God's people, if we'll humble ourselves and pray and seek His face and turn from our wicked ways, not them, not the world, not the rioters, not the murderers, if my people, I'll hear from heaven and I'll heal their land. And in some, or excuse me, in Isaiah 63 and verse 19, he says, where are thine Thou never bearest rule over them. They are not called by thy name. You know what that means? It means that the people of God oftentimes have become like they don't even know a holy God. The people of this world, it means that God's people oftentimes act like lost people. It means that you could take God's people, Many in the church this morning, and you could take lost people outside the church and you could put them side by side and you couldn't tell the difference. Is that not the day in which we're living, my friends? 
Are we not living in a day when you could line folks up and you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between the wheat and the tares? People live like they've never really been saved. People live like they've never been to the foot of the cross and, the, and, and, and you really can't see the difference anymore between the two. I know that revival in the minds of some folks is, a, is, a, is an old-fashioned concept. We used to think, you know, we have revival and we bring our friends and they get saved because people like Clark and Ergen, they just got away with the invitation and people walk the aisle. And, but revival is not for lost people. Revival is for God's people. I'm thinking of one preacher in particular, and I won't name his name, but he said this, all of you people who are praying for revival just need to quit praying for revival. There's no hope. America is gone. All that you can do in these last days is gather your family as close as you can and just ask God to put a protective hedge around them and you and study the Bible together and just endure until the end and eternity comes. I got to thinking about that, and I got to thinking, am I crazy to preach about revival this morning? Am, 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 I, am I crazy to, to realize that revival's needed? And, and what my Bible says, I believe revival's still possible. Am I, am I crazy to reject the methods that so many churches have taken on, these concepts that they've embraced today in the name of church growth? Am I crazy to reject uh, anything will do mentality to grow, draw a crowd? I mean, let's give out that, let's give out this, and let's have a party, and maybe we'll get people in the church, and let's just not preach the Word anymore. Am I crazy to believe that revival can happen? I, I, I thought about that and I thought, you know, and, and, and sometimes I feel like I'm this close myself. And I can't imagine what President Trump feels like. You know what I would do if I was President Trump? He's got a great wife, a great family, and billions of dollars. I would tell America to go get lost, and I'm putting it very nicely. I don't need this garbage. I got my life. I can live anywhere in the world comfortably for the rest of my life. Why in the world would he put up with that? I believe he loves America and wants to see good things for America. And I don't care what you think about him, but I'm telling you folks, this election is going to be extremely important and we are going to either go this way and, 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 and see some good things happen or we are going to go like that. And if you're not registered to vote, you need to register to vote. I'm not going to tell you how to vote, but I'm telling you this. Pro-life is the only way the Lord Jesus would vote. All lives matter to Jesus. And it's not just a life, it's a soul that will spend eternity in heaven or hell. And they're all important. Red and yellow, black and white, they're all precious in Jesus' sight. But I got to thinking about this. Uh, is, it, is it just a waste of time to preach about revival among God's people? And then I remember, because I'm studying this series in Revelation right now, and we're in the messages to the churches, and we're just barely in. We're, in, we're at Smyrna right now, which was a great church, one of only two of seven churches that the Lord Jesus didn't have a complaint against. And I got to remember in what it said at the end of chapter 3 in Revelation, where he's addressing the Laodicean church. That's the lukewarm church. That's the cold church. Uh, they're not cold or hot. They're apathetic. They're lethargic and they're lukewarm. And Jesus says, it makes me want to throw up. They're not acting any different than lost people. They're just blending in. Religion to them had just become a routine. And of course, this is representative of, of Christianity and how it will be when the Lord Jesus returns. And Jesus said to those lazy, lukewarm Christians, repent or else, turn or else, seek revival or else. I got a message next week, 4th of July weekend for America. Turn or burn. That's it, my friends. Turn or burn. Jesus describes the church as lukewarm and lifeless. They had a form of godliness but no power. And here's what he said. And you remember Jesus early on in chapter 1, He says, I am He that stands in the midst of the seven churches. 
I've got the stars in my hand, the angels of the church, and there's the churches, and I'm sending messages to the, to the angels to take and apply to their lives and to the church. And he says, you need to hear it, and you need to do it, or I'll remove the church. Ephesus was a church that lost their first love. And I don't know all the history of Ephesus, but I know this, there's no church in Ephesus today, and there's no city of Ephesus today. It's ruins. All of it's ruins. But guess what? Smyrna, Jesus had no complaint about. And in Turkey today, there's a, the, the ancient city of Smyrna is there and a thriving city around it. And even though Catholicism and the Muslim persecution is vast there, it's said that there's still a great movement of Christianity, true Christianity, in that place. He never removed their candlestick. They stuck with it. And they're still there today, several thousand years later. But here's what Jesus said to that lukewarm church. He said in verse 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will hear my voice, remember he's talking to the, the angels of the church, if any man will hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and sup with him and he with me. And so for me, when I think about revival, I've taken that as my charge as a pastor. And I reject those that say we need to dumb down the church so, so that we can be more like the world, so that people can be comfortable. We want, we want to be seeker friendly. We want people to come in and feel all warm fuzzies. That's fine. We're going to make them feel welcome. We're going to love on people. We're going to hug on people. And, and even in COVID, we're going to get right up in your grill and we're going to let you know we love you and Jesus loves you. But when the Word of God is preached, if you don't like it, then you can lump it. I reject those that say revival is a part of the past. And I want to, I just believe what Jesus said. If, if any man will hear my voice and open up the door, I'm going to come in. I, know, I realize people use this for evangelism, and that's a good application. When God knocks on your heart's door, all you got to do is open, receive. Receive and believe, and, and the Lord Jesus will come in. He'll save you. He'll put your, His Holy Spirit in you, and forever you'll be His child, alive in Christ Jesus. Alive in Christ Jesus. But I'll tell you what, when we open the door for Jesus as a Christian, as a church, He says, I'm going to move in. And I'm going to manifest my glory in that place. Amen? I want you to notice a few things with me this morning. Notice what happens when God sends revival. The first thing is this. The presence of God is manifested. And we know what the Bible says in Matthew 28 and verse 20. He says, And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. But you've got to remember also, and I love what Dr. Bob Gray used to preach. He used to say, because the whole verse says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, and lo, I am with you always. And, and, and uh, Dr. Bob Gray said, No go, no low. <laughs> You're not going to go share the gospel. You're not going to go do the work of Christ. Then you can't really sense and feel the presence of God. Now I realize God is omniscient. He's everywhere. He's omnipresent. He's all places at the same time. But I want to tell you, the God who's everywhere, I've seen moments in time when He comes down and He manifests His presence in such a real way, it's like physically He's there. You know what happens? We've all seen this before probably if you've been in church for any length of time. You walk in and you walk out and it's like there's something different about that service today. Did all the stars just line up perfectly? Did all of God's people get on their knees and pray for power and pray for God to show up? But you leave, you go to lunch, you go, hey, you know, I don't know what it was. I can't really put my finger on it, but man, worship today was just different in a good way. That's what happens when the presence of God is manifested, my friends. Isaiah 64, 1, notice what it says. Oh, that thou wouldest rend the heavens. That means tear open the heavens. That you personally, God, would come down. You know what? We shut up the heavens with our unbelief. We shut up the heavens with our fear and our worldliness and our complacency. When we come into church and we don't expect God to show up, we don't ask God to do something, then, then that shuts up the heavens. 
God says, fine, you can sp- uh, print your little spiritual menu that you do every week. Well, we'll be printing again next week once we get our new copier this week, right? But you can print that and go on. And so many churches do that. They got the menu, they got, they got the things, and, and the, every week, it's every week, it's every week, and God doesn't show up and they don't even know the difference. But here's a man that says, God ran the heavens. Tear them open. We're not, we don't want you to send out a program. <laughs> we don't want you to send down a plan. We don't need to go to some seminar. God, we want you personally to come down and manifest your presence in our midst. You know what happens when, when, when God shows up? Number one, it's a leveling work. It's a leveling work. God's going to tear down some things that the devil constructed. I've seen it. When, when, when the pastor's on his knees and the deacons are on their knees and the people of God are in one accord and praying, I've seen God do a leveling work and the cliques that used to control the church, they're blown out of here. The people that want to sow discord, they're blown out of here. The people that want to lie and cheat and deceit and whether they're lost or saved, they're blown out of here. And we get to have church with the Lord Jesus present because he did a leveling work. Notice verse 1. He said that thou wouldest rend the heavens, that thou mightest, or thou wouldest come down that the mountains. Now know that right there. What does that speak of? It speaks of obstacles of what God wants to do. The mountains. Mountains might flow down at thy presence. Think about mountains. You can think about mountains of difficulty. We all have those in our life, right? Mountains of difficulty, selfishness, apathy, the mountains of your past, the mountains of fear, of indifference, the mountains of sin. My friends, that's a big obstacle to what God wants to do in your life. And it's a big obstacle to what God wants to do in the church. Listen, when there's sin in the camp, we all suffer. Then there's the mountain-sized job that we have to take the gospel as just humble servants of the Lord Jesus to every creature in this world. There are so many lost people out there in the world, and it seems they're so unconcerned and so apathetic. It seems like such a mountain of unbelief, but folks, God can level mountains. I've seen it. Perhaps you were one of those mountains that God had to level. I serve the God that when He shows up, let me, th- let me tell you something, all the obstacles are gone. Amen? There's nothing too hard for our God. I want you to know the second thing. It's not only a leveling work, it's a purifying work. Verse 2. As when the melting fire burneth. Know that. The the Hebrew word there literally means brushwood. And it speaks of what people would do when they would burn off a field. They'd burn off a field. Why would they do that? They wanted all the weeds. They wanted all the trash out of there so that they could plant a crop. And that crop would grow and flourish. And even that which was dead that was consumed and burned would act as compost for for what was going to be grown in that field and to make it thrive. And the Bible says at the judgment seat of Christ, each of us are going to give an account. Amen? Every one of us will stand before Jesus. Every one of us is going to see Jesus burn away the wood, the hay, and all of the stubble. And only that which is gold, silver, and precious stones will be rewarded. So what's the wood, hay, and stubble? It's this simply. Everything that we did in the power of the flesh and for the flesh. My friends, the things... We said we did for God that we really did because we wanted to get applause. Burn. You've heard the story, only one life will soon be passed and only what's done for Jesus will last. That's true. He's going to burn away the wood, hay, and stubble. You know what? That habit, that sin, that fear, that lack of faith, that bitterness, that bad attitude, it's all going to be burned away. Amen? That's a good thing. That's a good thing. You see, when there's no revival, what happens with people? They, they develop a pessimistic attitude, and that's what's happened in so many churches. That's what's happened with so many pastors, and I feel their pain. But the God we serve is still on the throne, same yesterday, today, and forever, and He can still level mountains. It'll be a leveling work. Thirdly, it'll be a boiling work. Old-time preacher William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army, said this. He said, I like my faith like I like my tea. Boiling hot, amen? Doesn't that make good sense right there? Boiling hot. That's what my wife said when we got married. She goes, I like my men like I like my coffee. Hot. Hot. She really didn't say that. That's a lie. I made that up. But 
But folks, what good is a Christian that's lifeless? What good is a Christian that has no fire? I listen to some of these guys that say, have reverend in front of their name, and you don't have to ever call me reverend. You can call me bishop if you want, but don't call me reverend. But no, seriously. I listen to these guys, and they're so spineless, so yellow, and yet they're the ones that get on the news to represent us. Come to Texas and get a leather lung, I mean, just a bull in a china closet, independent, fundamental, Bible-believing, Baptist, crazy pastor like me. I'll say some things that they'll want to talk about. I mean, what good is religion with just dry creeds and fleshly deeds, right? You go to some churches, they kneel, they stand, they kneel, they stand, they kneel, they stand. I couldn't do that. Man, that kneeling would wipe me right out. I'd just have to go to hell if I had to kneel to get to heaven. I couldn't do it. But they do. They kneel, they stand, they quote these powerless creeds, prayers that are not personal. I've had the privilege of praying in, before some crowds and some dignitaries and things like that. And, and, and I see a lot of people do it, and they, they got their little note card. They've rehearsed some prayer. They've written it down. I'll tell you what, if you're on a regular day-to-day prayer basis with the Lord Jesus Christ in an intimate relationship with Him, I, don't need, I, I, I go talk to Brother Copeland. I don't need to go, uh, Brother Copeland, I, you're a good friend. I love you. Could we... Hold on, what's that word? No. It's communication. It's a relationship. What good is religion where some clergyman gets up there and he doesn't have the the power of God to blow that fuzzy stuff off of a dandelion? What good is a clergyman that gets up there in religion where he gets up there and he he, he wouldn't know God if he was hemmed up in a phone booth with him? He couldn't preach his way of a wet paper bag with a machete. What good is that? But folks, when God shows up and God manifests His Spirit in the church, things are going to change. Things are going to boil. That's what He says. He says, when the melting fire burns up, that brushwood, and God comes down, the fire causeth the waters to boil. And then there's going to be fire in the mouth of the preacher, amen? But listen, there's going to be, there's going to be fire in the, the music minister, and there's going to be fire in the fingers of the musicians, and there's going to be fire in the heart of the deacons, and there's going to be fire in the, in the lives of the Sunday school teachers. There's going to be fire in the young, and there's going to be fire in their old. And we're even going to see some of these senior saints of God that have been around for a long time, and all of a sudden the bursitis and the arthritis and the gingivitis isn't going to be what they're going to be talking about. They're going to be talking about Jesus Christ. They're going to boil and they're going to begin to serve God because there's going to be a fire in those old bones. I've seen it. We went to Bill Funderburg's funeral uh, yesterday as memorial service. And man, what a what a godly man. What a godly couple. His wife got up there and eulogized him. And man, she's a pistol. She's a pistol for Jesus. She got up there and she had grieved and hurt and they were, they were mourning. But she got up there and man, what a way to give God glory. I got goosebumps thinking about it. The way she got, gave God the glory for her family, for her husband of 55 years. They served in the ministry 30-something years. What a, what a blessing. And, and one of the things that come out over and over again about Bill Funderburg, this is Kimberly Robertson's daddy, He did what he did for God with excellence, with perfection to the best of his ability. He was on fire to the very end when the Alzheimer's got him, but to the very end he faithfully served God. And what a joy, what a joy. There's going to be a leveling work, a purifying work, a boiling work, but then notice there will also be a witnessing work. Most people outside the church, can I just tell you something? They don't care what's going on in here right now. They drive by and they don't go, ooh, you know, I just wonder what they're doing in there. I I don't get that. The lost, doomed, damned sinners are not sitting here this morning wondering, man, that, that could be some interesting stuff going on in there. That's why we're supposed to go out to them. 
That's why we're to let our light so shine before men that they may see our good work, see our heart, see our good attitude, see our passion, see our fire, see revival. They may see that and glorify our Father which is in heaven. And then all of a sudden they'll go, there's something different about those people. And the rest of the world, they've gone mad. But those people, they've got, a, they've got a firm grip on what's going on and what they're doing and where they're going. I need that, they say. Many churches literally drive themselves crazy trying to come up with some gimmicks to reach people. But folks, this is heart work, that what, what God does. It's heart work. And I found this out a long time ago because I was raised here and we've always done big things at Liberty. Back in the day, man, it, it, in the late 70s, early 80s, when no one else, I mean, these other churches in Wichita Falls, they didn't have a clue how to do anything. And Pastor Reed came in here. They'd been out in Midland, a church running 3,000 people in that day, back in the early 80s. And man, I'm telling you, we did the gospel circus and the gospel roundup and we had revival and we, I mean, God did a lot of things and God blessed. And of course, that was at the height of the Cold War and Ronald Reagan was president. All of us were feared that, in fear that Russia was going to nuke us any day. And I'm telling you, we come from the 70s with some lame presidents and a, and a depleted military at the height of Cold War. And, and, and it was like there was a resurgence of patriotism and, and there was a resurgence of, of the things of God and the church. And, uh, and the church grew. And, but what, what was all that? Was it all because of those things? We didn't know it was heart work then and it's heart work now. And it's God who does it. It's God who, who, who does it. Listen, you can't make a man get saved. I've tried, I've prayed, I've begged God, but you can't make a man get saved. You can't get a man convicted of his sins. You can talk to your blue in the face and he'll just go, no one judges me. You can't get the attention of a lost man with something you conjure up. Have you figured this out? I did a long time ago because I've seen it. And, and, and some of you guys remember, but we've had, we've had services here, special anniversary services, and I know how to do it. I worked in the business world in advertising and marketing, and, and I know how to do it. We filled this place up on the floor and on the balcony where there was other chairs being put out. This, that was back when we had the pews, and it seated probably twice as much as what it will now. Once, one, one year we fed 750 people. We fed them. Brandon Iron. We had to rent tables and tents. And by the way, when that auditorium was filled on the floor and in the balcony completely to capacity, there wasn't one child in here. We had a tent filled with the kids out there. My friend Kent, Kenneth Terrell came and, 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 and did child evangelism and J.B. Balders came and did child evangelism and man, we had a lot of souls saved and, and that was a great thing. But you know what? We never got one family ever from doing all that stuff and spending ten to $15,000 every time. Never one family. You know why? You can't out Las Vegas, Las Vegas. Church can't out Broadway, Broadway and we've never been called to do such. We've been called simply to preach the gospel, to be faithful, and then to go out to the highways and the hedges and to compel them with that gospel to come in. Amen? Jesus said this, and, and He said, Upon this rock, I'm going to build my church. And folks, it's Jesus that builds the church. It's men that get a crowd. It's Jesus that builds the church. Amen. Isaiah 64, 2 said that the nations may tremble at what? Thy presence. Thy presence. You see, God is working, but God is unnoticed in this world in which we live. I promise you, if all these people that are doing the things that they're doing, and I don't want to get too political here, but I'm telling you, if they, if they would just realize for a moment that God is watching, they would think differently. Because a lot of them are doing it in the name of Christ. A lot of them are doing it in the name of Christianity. And I'll tell you, black lives do matter, but so do white lives and red lives and green lives and brown lives. All life matters to Jesus. And if that group's so concerned about life, why don't they start with the 30,000 abortions of black babies every year? Amen? You know what I think BLM stands for? Burning, looting, and murder. My wife and I drove by a Baptist church, a prominent Baptist church, huge. It was a little weird because they had a pyramid on top of it, so I don't know what that's all about but they had a banner the size of this auditorium on the side of the church that said that.
what are they doing? Trying to get a crowd. I had my wife look at the website. They preach the Bible and they preach black history. And I, I'm, I think black history is important. It's good. All history is important. History not learned from repeats itself. Amen? And some of my best friends in the world are people of color. I have nothing against that. I don't look at people and, and, and form an opinion because of that. Now, if you look like a criminal, I don't care what color you are, I'm going to be looking kind of closely at you make sure you don't jump me. But I tell you what, God didn't call us to that. I'm passionate about our nation. I love our nation. But God impressed upon my heart again yesterday. If I'm not careful, I can let all of that take away from what I'm supposed to be doing. And, I, it, and God gave me the verse, no man that wars, he's talking about the spiritual war, entangles himself with the affairs of this life. You understand what I'm saying? But here's the thing. People take for granted and people never take time to even send up a prayer into God's presence. And then when God shows up and begins to manifest His glory and the fires of revival are ignited in the church of the living God, suddenly people begin to show up. Not because we out Vegas, Las Vegas, or because we're having some big deal. They begin to show up because they know we've been revived and they need that and they want that. Amen? So then we can go to our jobs, our schools, our neighbors, and we'll have the power of God overflowing in us, and people will see it. Amen? I want you to notice the second thing this morning. Notice the fullness of Christ is desired. The presence of Christ is manifested, but the fullness of Christ becomes desire, is desired when revival breaks out. Colossians 2.9 says, All of the Godhead dwells in Jesus Christ bodily. And yet I think a lot of people, when they think about, they don't realize their birthright in Christ. When they think about Christianity, what is Christianity to you, sir? Well, I'm not going to hell. They've got hell insurance. What is Christianity to you, miss? Well, I'm not going to hell. What is Christianity to you, Christian, sir? Well, I'm not going to hell and I get to go to church quite a bit. You see, folks, many Christians do not understand that there's more. They don't understand the wealth of the believer. And God impressed us upon my heart yesterday driving all those miles. We, we don't understand the forgiveness and the peace and the abundant life and the direction and the purpose and the wisdom that we can have in Christ Jesus. They don't understand all the power and authority that we have in a holy God to deal with the strongholds of hell. Amen? So many times the devil comes to us and we just go hook, line, and sinker. Okay. We don't even put up a fight, we can't resist the devil because we haven't first and foremost submitted ourselves to God. They don't understand all the power and authority. They don't, they don't understand all that is found in the Lord Jesus Christ and it's their birthright, folks. This is our birthright. Anybody saved here this morning? Amen. Isaiah 64, 4 says, From since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor perceived by the ear, neither hath the eye seen. Now listen, O God, besides thee, what he hath prepared for them that waiteth for him. Did you know that the Apostle Paul quoted this same passage over in 1 Corinthians 2, 9 and 10? And here's what he said. But as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yea, and the deep things of God. How do we know that we can have power? How do we know that we can have purpose in life? How do we know that there's a plan and God's in control of it? Because the Holy Spirit of God bears witness with my spirit. I was talking to somebody this week about you know, the Bible, and I sent out a video to some folks just about the origins and stuff I've known for years, but... God just really laid it on my heart. If you want that video, let me know and I can text it to you. But it just talks about the, the origin of the Bible and the great sacrifices that were made and the persecutors that caused those sacrifices oftentimes to be implemented. It'll, it'll, it'll be surprising to you. But I got to thinking, you know, some, someone I was talking to this week, go, well, you know, I read the Bible, but, you know, I get helps and confirmation from some other things. You know what? I don't need that garbage. 
I'm not saying that there's not some good books out there. I'm not saying that there's not commentaries out there. There's been times I've read commentaries, but I'm telling you this, I've got the Holy Spirit of God living in me. And when I take the Word of God, the Holy Spirit of God teaches it to the child of God. And it's illuminated. I don't go, well, there's a word thou here. What does that really mean? Let's get a dictionary. The Holy Spirit teaches you. The Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we're the children of God. And it never ceases to amaze me, Brother Copeland, as I'm reading, as I'm studying, and how God works. And it's just like in that moment in time I realize, you know what? That's not me. I'm not some super smart guy. I don't have any wisdom. That's God. And it's a great joy to me to realize that because, again, the Holy Spirit bears witness with my spirit. I'm a child of God. Amen? Here's your birthright as believers. This is not just for pastors. This is for you, every one of you that are saved this morning. There's a spiritual wealth in the ways of God that you can walk in. Notice what he says in verse 5. Thou meetest him that rejoiceth and worketh righteousness. For some reason, a lot of Christians don't get this, but when revival comes, all of a sudden you're interested in the things of God. All of a sudden, the Word is important. The teaching of the Word, the preaching of the Word, we don't discount it. Well, pastor, they had a fruit sale over at United and it started at church time. I'm sorry, but... No, the Word of God's being taught. Why in the world would you miss that? I hath not seen nor heard, neither hath entered into the heart of men the things which God hath prepared for them that love Him. God is able to do abundant and exceedingly more than we can ever ask or think. Now think about that because I can think of some pretty big stuff. And God can do more. I can think of some pretty amazing things that I want heaven to be like. God can do more. What he says is, as big as your brain is and as big as your mouth is, Rick, you can't even imagine what I've prepared for you. In revival, we pray big prayers, bold prayers, and we expect big blessings from God. Amen. Why? Because when revival comes, the presence of God is manifested and the fullness of Christ is desired. Notice lastly this morning, the conviction of the Holy Spirit is experienced when revival comes. We haven't had a winter revival in a while, but when, uh, when Clark comes, he never, or whoever I have come, Ergen, or I'm very picky on who I turn this pulpit over to. Have you noticed that? You know why? I give an account for every word that's spoken, whether it's from me or from somebody else. I give an account to God for it. That's why the Bible says, obey them that have a rule over you. Why? They watch for your souls as they must give an account and let them do it with joy and not with bitterness or hurt. The conviction of the Holy Spirit is experienced. Folks, This is the state of the human race. Every member of the human race is in this spiritual condition. Notice verse 6. But we are all. All means what? All. That's me, that's you, that's all. We are all, everyone, as an unclean thing. You know what that word applies? Now, we've got COVID-19 in our world. And let me tell you, we thought things were crazy in Wichita Falls, Texas. Take a trip out to East Texas and go through the Metroplex. We went in yesterday, my wife loves P.F. Chang's, and so we're on the way back and we're going to get some P.F. Chang's. Well, we happen to have masks because we were at a funeral. Now, listen, I don't wear masks. The only time I've worn them is when it was required at my other job and when it was required uh, at Sam's Gibbs Music, when it was required at the funeral. And I did that because I love them and I'm going to do whatever I need to do. Other than that, I don't wear a mask. They gave me, in one restaurant, they gave me a, a handkerchief, and I put it over my mask like this, looked like, a, looked like a, a bandito from the old west days, and I said, we're not interested in food, this is a stick up, give me all your money, and the, the girls were like, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, unclean, we've got the COVID stuff, well back in the Lord's day, they had leprosy. Now, you think COVID's bad, it can kill you. Leprosy will kill you, only you start losing one little body part after another along the way. 
you'll lose toes, you'll lose fingers, you'll lose hands, you'll lose limbs, and ultimately the gangrene will, will kill you. These people, what, they, what did they have to do back then? And it's kind of getting that way today here. They'd have to go, unclean, unclean, stay away. They were bound by law to do that. They were polluted by leprosy. Can I just tell you this? You might not have leprosy, and I hope you don't. You don't have COVID. I hope you don't. And I hope you never get it. But every one of us are polluted by sin. Every one of us. And can I tell you, while all these physical things will die when we die and they'll go away, sin carries us into eternity if we won't deal with it at the foot of the cross. Sin is something, and let me tell you, other people haven't, it, and it can get on you too if you're not careful. I'm going to tell you something. We are all unclean things, and it says that right there in verse 6, for we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are as filthy rags. You know, you know what that means? Well, there, I'll tell you, I won't go into great detail because I don't want to gross anybody out, but it's, it's, it's really, you can think of the rags used in medical situations that would be the worst kind of thing that you could possibly see, and that's what it's talking about. Soak, soiled, bloody rags. And that's how he describes our righteousness. Our righteousness. And all our righteousness are as filthy rags. We're unclean things and our righteousness are filthy rags. I, I was watching a video the other day, and I'm, I'm going to hurry up here. But there was a, 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 a lady protester, it's a white lady protesting in one of these cities, and, and, and she's got a mask on, and she's, she's preaching uh, about racist. Well, you're racist, you're racist. The two guys she's talking to are African-American police officers. And then there's another white police officer who has an African-American wife. And she's, I wouldn't, he's saying, you can, I can be racist. She goes, well, not racist, but there's systemic racism. Systemic. They put a big word that nobody understands, so, they, so then they, it makes it sound legit. And then the officer, and I love this, one of the African-American officers walked up to her. She, he said, and he didn't have a mask on, by the way. She goes, stand back, sir. I don't want to get COVID. Stand back. He says, you know what we all got? We've got a sin problem. Systemic sin, that's the problem. Amen. What's the problem between with you? What's the problem with me? What's the problem with all of this? A systemic sin problem. We're born with it. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none righteousness, no, not one. There's none righteous, no, not one. Romans 10.10. 10. There's none that seeketh after God. What is he talking about? Filthy rags. And then he says, we all do fade as the leaf. That's what sin does. You ever seen some of these folks, these political folks, these people on TV, and they look like the crypt keeper? I didn't say Nancy Pelosi, but somebody was thinking it, okay? I didn't say that. What does sin do? It just causes you to wither up and to fade away like a leaf. It's, it's blown like the chaff. You look at the condition of lost people, doomed, damned, and on their way to hell. And, and the best you could do, look like filthy rags, I'd be a little concerned about it. Amen? I wouldn't think that since the Lord Jesus paid it all at Calvary by His righteousness to wash those sins away that we would ignore that fact. I'm going to tell you something, church. They've gone after statues, started out with, you know, and I can, un I can understand some of the things and what they stand for. I, I get the fact that we've got good history and bad history. I can go down the antique store and buy a Nazi flag that's got a swastika on it from World War II. That's a bad, rep it represents bad. But I'll tell you what, it's something that's a good reminder of what, that it happened. You know, Germany does not teach their school children about the Holocaust at all, zero. My brother had two German families at his house last night. I've met them, they're good people. And we've talked about this, about the Holocaust better. They said they don't even talk about it. what they do? They wrote it out of history. They're trying to re revise history. 
all really to, to destroy nationalism so we can become a globalist society, so we can have a one-world religion and a one-world government. And you, you, you think I'm kidding. You know what they're coming for next? They've gone for the monuments. They've even got Jefferson down yesterday, Thomas Jefferson. They're going after Washington. They'll go after Rushmore. But now some numbskull, and, and this is so crazy, this, this numbskull on Twitter said that white Jesus and stained glass are systemically racist. I'm telling you the truth. And all of them should be taken down. And then he had the audacity to tweet on Twitter, could y'all please pray for my mom? They just admitted her into the hospital. And I'm like, okay, I will. But boy, there's a lot of things I'd sure like to say to you, dude. And now you got pastors up north, they're all standing together going, we're going to do what we can to protect our monuments. Listen, we don't have any monuments, okay? We have a church that people bled and sweat and probably almost died to build, and we're going to protect that so we have a place to meet, amen? Let me tell you what they're coming for next, my friends. The cross. The cross. We know that it was used in ancient times, and that's why we, we, that's why we carry the cross. That's why we look to the cross because it's a reminder of what the Lord Jesus did for us. Amen. Amen? It's a symbol of Christianity. They're coming for it. What are you going to do? You're going to sit back and go, well, just, you know. Or are you going to do something about it because it's not going to stop with what they're... You give them an inch, they're going to take a mile. You give them a little bit, you give them this, you give them that. It'll never satisfy. They're going all the way. Because the biggest obstacle to globalism is religion. And they're going to start destroying the icons, then they'll start destroying God's people. They take the cross, and then they'll be putting us on crosses before long. You think I'm kidding? You look at the history of Germany and what they did. Same exact game plan. The socialists, the communists use the same playbook every single time. And what's happening today is nothing new. It's exactly what happened in Nazi Germany. Why do I say all that? Because, folks, we need to understand that the Lord Jesus Christ paid it all. And the Lord Jesus Christ is the answer to this. And I was so privileged and glad to see that, that there were pastors praying with some of these guys. And that's what they need. They need prayer. And they need prayer that they might find the Lord Jesus Christ. Not that they change their mind about politics, but that they find the Lord Jesus Christ and they simply do the right thing, no matter the politic. Amen? There's none that calleth upon thy name, verse 7. Notice it. There's none that calleth upon thy name that stirreth up himself to take hold of thee. To take hold of thee. What's the answer, folks? Again, it's not a program, a plan, or a personality. What's going to touch doomed damn sinners? They're not calling the name of the Lord. They're not stirring themselves up. They're not feeling conviction. When revival comes, Holy Spirit conviction comes. Amen? The Bible even talks about how a woman wedded to an unsaved man, that how he can be saved by observing the chaste conversation of the wife. See, that when the wife lives for Jesus and represents that which is righteous and holy and reflects what that looks like, he's going to see, you know what, I knew her when she wasn't like that. Now something's different. And she comes to him in love and caring. And he submits his heart to Christ. I think of the Philippian jailer, how God worked in his life. He had, he had pr imprisoned Paul and Silas. They're praying and having worship at the midnight hour. An earthquake happens and the prison walls fall down and Paul and Silas could have ran. And the, the prison guard had taken a nap or went to sleep and he came in there. He grabbed his sword. He was going to take his life rather than be tortured by the Roman uh, bosses of his because he, he felt the prisoners were gone. And Paul said, do thyself no harm. We're all here. And he, the Philippian jailer seeing that, he goes, why in the world would they be here? 
They're singing hymns and, and preaching and, and calling on the name of God. He said, what must I do to be saved, guys? Amen? They were revived and souls got saved. I think of the 120 people in that upper room and there they are and, and they're saying, we're going to meet in this upper room and we're not going to let go until God comes in and God takes over. Amen? That's what we need. We don't need God to come in and take sides. We need God to come in and take over. And they stayed up there and they tarried and they prayed and all of a sudden the heavens tore open. The Holy Spirit of God came down. And remember the effect of that old Simon Peter? He had denied the Lord Jesus three times. He was, yeah, when, you, when everybody else denies you, you can count on me. He denied Jesus three times, went out and wept bitterly. But then Pentecost comes around. And with great boldness, old Peter... A wishy-washy Peter with his foot stuck in his mouth. He had hoof and mouth disease. Preaches a message anointed by the Holy Spirit of God and the Spirit of God fell and 3,000 people got saved as a result of it. They had ignored the miracles. They had ignored the cross of Christ and the seven saints of the cross. Even Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. They saw that. They ignored that. They ignored the empty tomb. They ignored all the teaching of Jesus. But when Peter got up there, he was revived and souls got saved. Amen? Repent and turn to the Lord Jesus in faith. That's what he said. And the Bible says in that one service, listen, they didn't have coffee and donuts. They didn't have a sound system. They didn't have comfortable chairs. They didn't have air conditioning. They didn't have literature. The Bible says 3,000 got saved because the gospel went forth in the power of the Holy Spirit by revived men. We need God to come down in our church, my friends. And we need God to take over. I said it last week, what's the answer for America? It's not going to start in the White House. It's not going to start in the, the courthouse. It's not going to start in the county house. It's not going to start even in the church house until it first and foremost starts in our house. Amen? It starts in our house. I don't know what the need is in your life this morning. I know this. I need reviving. I need a push from the Holy Spirit of God. I beg God to fill me with the Spirit before I ever come out here and speak to you to preach the Word, to fill my mind with His thoughts, my mouth with His words, and I believe that God does that. But I tell you, on a personal level, I'm tired. On a personal level, I'm mentally worn out right now with all this. I love America. I love this country. I'd give my life for this country. My family's here, and if the Lord Jesus tarries, my, my kids will have life here. My grandkids will have life here. And I want the best for America. But more than anything, I just want, to, I want the best for the Lord Jesus Christ from me. And what that's going to take is for me to be revived and you to be revived, to get a new fresh fire, Amen? To see the, the purpose, the plan, as we celebrate the presence of God on each of our lives and get busy doing it faithfully. Evan Roberts was a, a young man in, <clears throat> in the Welsh community. He was with a group of people that vowed that they were going to pray for revival for their nation. They would pray every single week faithfully, 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 faithfully. Ten years passed and no revival. Ten years. Sometimes I've given up on prayer after three minutes, it seems like. Ten years. One of the elderly men, he said, you know, I just don't know if I, I should keep coming. It doesn't seem like God's hearing or answering. And one of, the, one of the elderly men told old Evan Roberts, he said, you don't want to be a Doubting Thomas, do you? See, Doubting Thomas wasn't there when the Lord Jesus showed up the first time. He missed out. I don't know what he was doing, but he missed out. It was when he had to come in the room and with Jesus and Jesus had to finally say, look, it's me. See my hands, see my feet, feel my side. He said, don't be a doubting Thomas. He said, well, I'll, I'll keep on then. That night they were praying as always. And it was like the Holy Spirit of God fell on that place and People begin to say, God, bend us. God, bend us. 
God, bend us in prayer. A church calling out for revival holistically. But then Evan Robbins stood up and he said, God, bend me. Bend me, God. God, use me. And fire took hold in that church and revival broke out. And friends, I'm going to tell you, Evan Robert took the gospel across that nation and thousands upon thousands upon thousands over a course of years came to Jesus Christ and revival continued and continued and continued because one young man said, Lord, it's easy to pray holistically, do this for us. It's a different thing to say, God, do it in me now. Let's stand with our heads about nice eyes closed. Father, thank you so much for your word. God, you know my heart this morning. And Lord, it's so easy sometimes as a pastor and Lord, just as a, a person that works in the world and raising kids and doing jobs and trying to be faithful in service to you, Lord, just to, to become tired. And if we're not careful, we can let that become a pattern in our lives. We can not just be physically tired, but then we can get spiritually tired and that leads to spiritual lethargy. And spiritual lethargy leads to spiritual apathy. And if it continues, we can find ourselves down the road of being so far away from you and what you desire to use us for in the work that we don't even recognize it anymore. God, the prayer this morning for me is, Lord, bend me. Impress upon my heart and my life your desire and your plan for me and my wife, and my family. Lord, as I lead this church, as I pastor this church, press upon my heart what we as a people need to do. Help us to engage our hearts and minds, not just on default run, with the motor running, go about doing things, but Lord, help us to engage our hearts and minds to not do stuff, but to do what you desire. Do what you bless. And of course, God, I pray for the lost that might be here today that have never given their life to Christ. They know how to do church, but their life is empty. There's no peace. They don't sense the presence of God. God, please convict hearts today. Save the lost. Empower your people. Let us sense your holy presence. We'll give you the glory for it all. In Jesus' name.
And all God's people said, we'll be seated for just a moment. Let me share with you just a few things real quickly. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for being here this morning. We love you and appreciate your faithfulness. And I, I hope the message was just an encouragement to all of us to really just simply evaluate where we are, you know, not in this moment, but as we go out of here and live our lives uh, with God looking on, what does that look like to Him? And, and, and what adjustments do we need to make? And, and what part is, is, does God really have in, in the adjustments that we're making in the lives that we're living? And I just pray that more than anything that God would be glorified in each of our lives. Amen? Amen. Well, this morning, uh, just by way of announcements, of course, remember, uh, with, with, the, with the elevated numbers, uh, you know, with more people getting in and out, and I, told, uh, I can tell you we were on Interstate 20 for hours there's people from all over the world <laughs> coming in to Texas and North Texas. And, uh, and so uh, just continue to practice uh, good hygiene. Wash your hands often, hand sanitizer, uh, you know, especially those of you that are at risk because of age or health. Uh, you know, wear the mask if, 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 that, if that helps. I know some people breathe in the carbon monoxide, makes them lightheaded and stuff, so... I don't know what the real answer is, but just be safe is what I'm saying. And, you know, we sterilize everything here at the church weekly uh, after each service and, and uh, with the nursery sterilized, all those toys are cleaned every week and stuff. So, and of course, if, you, if you've been around anybody that you know has got that thing, uh, while you might not, it might not bother you or the majority of your people, just be considerate of the, the one or two that you could come in contact with that could, it could give them a big problem. And so let's be safe. Let's be smart. Amen. We're all adults here. Well, not all of us, but most of us are. And uh, let's help the younger ones that aren't adults to, to wash their hands, wash their hands. And that's what I always tell the boys when they're coming in out. Wash your hands, wash your hands. Did you wash your hands? Well, all I, all I had was a bullfrog in my hand a while ago. Uh, wash your hands. All I had was a catfish. Wash your hands. So anyway, uh, yeah, let's do that a lot. And we keep everything clean here at the church. And uh, remember, Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, uh, we're continuing our series on Wednesday nights uh, in Revelation. Of course, uh, Brother Miss Hill and Cullen, they have their class, uh, the Crossroads and, and the God Squad going on on Wednesday nights. And so be sure and uh, uh, have your kids faithful to that. And, uh, and then the, the children's ministry, my wife is teaching that right now. And they've been having some really good classes for the children's ministry. And there's plenty of time to play and get candy and all that but then the nursery as well. So we've got all these things going on on Wednesday nights. And then coming up uh, on July the 12th, we've got scheduled a concert that night, and I kind of mixed... I was going to say, we can push it back to next. You want to push the concert one week? Okay. Well, we're going to have our refresh on the 12th, and we'll do the live concert the following Sunday night at 6 o'clock, okay? So plan on that right now. Uh, we'll see how things go. And like I said, if the restaurants are... Uh, not able to take us, then we'll, we'll do something out in the Family Life Center, and uh, we'll, we'll bring uh, finger foods and desserts and watermelon and maybe cook some hot dogs and hamburgers or something, but we'll, we'll do that, and, and it'll be really good. And uh, I was going to do one of those later this year in the park, uh, and we'll probably still do that, but if we need to uh, meet here for the 12th, because we need to get together and, and just relax and enjoy each other's company, amen? Sunday morning is not the time for that, and you can stick around Wednesday night, but most people are tired from work, so uh, fellowship is a very important part, and so we'll, 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 we do that on Sunday nights, and uh, by the way, for our, some folks that uh, are not familiar, we do dinner on the grounds right after Sunday morning a lot of times as well, and that leads me to the next uh, thing I wanted to share with this morning. We have coming uh, some, some sweet dear folks, and uh, I'll let him give his testimony one of these days real soon and just give you a little bit of uh, his history, but retired pastor and pastor's wife for many, many years, and uh, he's uh, also a professional carpenter. Praise God for that. We can always use carpenter skills. Uh, you don't want me cutting up on anything or doing anything, but anyway, uh, what a blessing. Uh, Ken and Kathy Johannan uh, comes this morning. They both are obviously saved and know the Lord Jesus and been in the ministry for many, many years. They come desiring to join Liberty Baptist Church by uh, transferring their letter from a Baptist church of like faith and practice. They live in Henrietta, and they drive here like Brother Chell every service from Henrietta. Uh, that, that's a big deal right there. And, and folks, we take note of that, and we appreciate your commitment to the Lord 
and to Liberty Baptist Church to make that drive, spend that money in gas and that extra time to get ready to be here. And so all of you that are happy about Ken and Kathy coming to be a part of Liberty Baptist Church, you let them know it. Amen. Yeah. Anything else I need to mention, Brother Hill? Those of you guys on the lawn crew, I really appreciate you so very much. Uh, I was not able to be here because I was out of town at that funeral, and I try to always uh, do some of the mowing myself uh, you know, since Brother Hill was basically doing everything. And so uh, if, if there's another one of you guys out there that, that want to come out Saturday morning uh, a little bit early, uh, there's riding mowers, weed eaters, blowers. You can just pick up a little bit of trash, uh, sweep things. There's just a lot of different things. Or you can just come and bring... Uh, Diet Dr. Peppers and donuts to the pastor if you want. But anyway, that's every Saturday morning, and we'll be back on task next, next week. And so I'll be there. But thank you, everybody that's committed to that ministry. I appreciate you so very much. Let's give them a big hand for making the, the church look so good. And all of our cleaning people that clean every week and do such an amazing job, we appreciate you as well. Well, let's stand. We'll be dismissed in prayer. And I'm going to ask Brother Ken and, and Miss Kathy, if they'll come and stand here, my wife will come and stand with them. And, uh, and y'all come by, each and every one of you, take a moment, come by, give them the right hand of fellowship. Now, they won't remember your name, but you can remember their name. And let's, do, let's start a long relationship of family together. And so thankful that God's brought you our way. We praise God for that. All right, well, let's be dismissed in prayer. Uh, since Brother Willie Coffey's raising his hand, I'm going to ask him to word the dismissal prayer this morning.